Um, this is a webinar that is uh, last in the asset management series. Um, we started uh, around um, quarter four uh, last year, mid last year, uh, mid mid of, mid of 2021. Um, so today we'll be talking about um, key components of a robust rail owner operator O and M agreement. So um, next slide a bit of introduction about myself. Right, um, so as I introduced myself before, Joseph, this is my name. Um, I have 25 years of experience in railway engineering. I spent a few years in uh, maintenance, looking out after a team of maintainers, um, especially working on um, the um, corrective and preventive maintenance of signaling and train control equipment. I was also tasked uh, for a few years looking after the OCC. I have ex extensive experience in the design maintenance um, of rail, railway uh, systems in um, a few major projects in Asia. And I am a past uh, railway section chairman of the IET um, railway section, and uh, I am also a pioneer of asset management uh, for WSP Asia. So now I'll let Tim introduce himself. Thanks, Joseph. Hi, my name is Tim Aldborough. Um, I'm a technical director based in Singapore. Uh, originally trained as a structural engineer, and having delivered several multidisciplinary rail sector projects. I got involved with asset condition assessment and asset management. I've worked extensively in Europe and Asia uh, for transport assets, highways, bridges, and railway infrastructure and railway systems. Um, but I'm still, I guess, a civil engineer at heart. So both Joseph and I hold diplomas from the Institute of Asset Management, um, which gives us a good grounding in ISO 55000 and other requirements uh, in the asset management field. I'll hand back, Joseph. Thanks, Tim. So why this webinar and why is asset management um, in Asia important? So in many parts of Asia, uh, our railways are 30 to 40 years old. Um, not like European railways or American railways, where their age is, um, some of them are like 50, 60, um, others are almost 100 years old. In Asia, uh, um, if you've been here, a lot of railways are relatively new. But having said that, the assets, especially the uh, electrical, electronic, mechanical assets, um, once they are around, 15 um, to 20 or even 30, they are very old. So this webinar will look at some key components of a ro robust owner operator agreement for urban railways that ensure effective asset management through robust and long-term operations and maintenance of civil infrastructure, track, stations, depots, railway systems, and associated equipment. So in the last six to seven years, me and Tim has been looking at um, assets, at the conditions uh, for various operators in Asia. Like I said before, 15 years is old for electronic assets, and a lot of them need replacement. That's why when um, new op assets come into play uh, and needs to be transferred to the operator, there needs to be a robust agreement in place. And this is quite important when a lot of Asian um, assets are purchased from overseas suppliers. So procurement issues and timelines are very important. So for, for the purpose of this webinar, we have uh, put our um, focus 
on one particular um, project that we recently worked on. Um, it also it involved evaluation of an existing O&M agreement that the asset owner wished to improve to overcome challenges encountered. It's a transition of assets, new assets between owner and operator at the commencement of service. We will also look at the challenges and the procedure adopted in tackling them, how we overcame them and what benefits this will bring to the client. Okay, next. So a bit of recap, especially for uh, operators, why asset management is important. When you operate a railway, financial performance is paramount. So good asset management will improve financial performance. It will give you informed asset investment decisions. It will also help you manage risk, especially safety risk and service risk. Good asset management will improve services and outputs. You'll demonstrate social responsibility to your clients as an operator. Um, your clients are your passengers. You'll demonstrate compliance, whether it's um, quality standards or asset management standards. You will have enhanced reputation, improve organizational sustainability, and lastly, efficiency and effectiveness on your operations. Next slide. Do you want me to take over on this one? No, oh, okay. I'll just speak these five okay. um, components. Yeah. Yep. So in, in this case study um, on an Asian operator, we will look at uh, five key, uh, five components of uh, good management of a robust operations and maintenance agreement, and to align them with the challenges of our client which is facing these um, components. First one is clear regulatory environment responsibilities and reporting lines. Second, responsive to financial framework. Third, whole of life approach to operations and maintenance. Fourth, agree key performance indicators. And last, last one is interface management between operators. This will help the client look at the assets from um, asset management framework. So now I will pass to Tim who will talk about the challenges um, on these five key components. Thanks, Joseph. So yeah, as Joseph has just said, this is reference a particular case study for this webinar. Um, hopefully in the Q&A session a bit later on, we can um, look at maybe slightly broader kind of picture, but for this particular webinar, I think this case study is quite interesting. So, um, so many public and private railway asset owners outsource the operations and maintenance of their railway services and the infrastructure and the systems and they tend to do it for relatively short contractual periods. And it's different in many different environments. In, in this particular environment, um, the length of contract is, is somewhere between five and 10 years, and often with a sort of follow on plus two years or plus five years, depending on the performance. And any less than five years, and there can be challenges in training staff, maintaining expertise and, and competence. So um, that's the type of framework that we're looking at it. During the contract renewal for this particular client, um, it was a simultaneous contract renewal for an existing line that was being operated and handover of a new line, um, which had interfaces together. Um, and our client, the asset owner, wanted to implement a clear and robust O&M agreement um, and enhance the existing O&M agreement that was in place um, they wanted more visibility and accountability of the operator's asset management performance during the contract term and beyond. So the asset life was greater than the 
term of uh, operations and maintenance. And so they wanted to have visibility of that as well. How was the operator ensuring that they were speaking into that whole of life situation? We'll look at that again in a bit more detail. Um, and yeah, these were some of the challenges as listed on the slide. So to address these challenges, we reviewed and redrafted the existing operations and maintenance agreement um, that was in place already between the asset owner and the operator. Um, and we did that in response to the regulatory and financial environment into which the ONM agreement was to be introduced. Um, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail on the next slide. Um, to influence the behavior of the operator, um, to gain a more responsive and proactive asset management performance from the operator, um, and to create an aspirational environment so that we could measure performance, current performance on a regular basis so that we could work towards uh, continual improvement of that performance. That was important to the client as well. So looking at these five chosen um, key components, um, different railways, you may want to emphasize different ones, but I thought these were quite uh, insightful for this particular case study. So um, and let's look at one challenge as well for each of these um, in a sort of real world situation. So clear lines of responsibility need to be established between the asset owner and the operator whilst being mindful of other stakeholders. So often there are government regulators, maybe the government itself has a stake because they've invested in this asset. Um, they may have indirectly put together a, a, an organization that's going to be the asset owner, but ultimately that might still be um, a government company, a GOCO as, as we call it in some regions. Um, and so, yeah, we had to be mindful of this uh, responsibility uh, arrangement because the operator tended to focus on the regulator. The regulator was the one that gave them their license. So that was obviously important. So, but we wanted to clarify in the agreement between the asset owner and the operator, um, how the operator must report. And that might seem obvious, but it's not always. And the operator may want to determine for themselves what they're going to report to the asset owner. The asset owner may wish to have a different set of information being reported. So one challenge was the asset owner had limited visibility of how the operator chose and assessed the competence of their subcontractors. And this was a challenge. Um, after a number of workshops and discussions, it was very evident that the operator had a process. Um, but they tended to keep it to themselves. They thought it was only really important for their own operations to understand that their subcontractors were competent and they didn't share that necessarily with the asset owner. But in audit situations, because the asset owner carries out audits on the operator's performance, there were a number of uh, issues that arose due to maintenance uh, issues with subcontractor effort. So it was important that they were able to see that those subcontractors had been vetted and were able to evidence competence and do what they needed to do. Um, so we were, a, we were able to ensure that this process would be shared. The owner understood, the asset operator understood that the owner wanted to see that process and that it could be reviewed on a regular basis and that it was beneficial for both parties that that happened. I mean, sometimes um, it's important to try and emphasize that it, it's beneficial in, in both directions to have review on a regular basis of, of different processes. The second one of these key components, responsive to financial framework. So um, we need to understand what that financial framework is. Um, in our financial framework, the asset owner kept all the non-fair revenue. Non-fair revenue could be from advertising, from naming rights at the stations, um, from other potential um, sources as well. And the operator kept all the fair revenue. And the agreement needed to address adequate compensation for operations and maintenance activities. So in some 
railways, there isn't sufficient income from purely from the uh, fair revenue to finance the operations and maintenance, and therefore there has to be a, a realistic uh, financial framework to ensure that there is sufficient money. Um, and so there were agreed payments for specialist maintenance and capital expenditure, uh, capex we call it here, so that um, the, the burden didn't fall on the O&M operator. And then the assurance that necessary third party agreements are entered into. So for instance, if you have um, the ability to pay for your ticket with a credit card, then the operator has to enter into an agreement with banks basically to ensure that that payment is facilitated. Um, that may not seem like a maintenance issue, but it's an operations issue. Um, and it's a, obviously a customer experience and, and customer um, support situation. And then the asset owner needed advanced visibility of specialist maintenance. So in order to ensure that specialist maintenance was paid for by the asset owner, the operator, the, the asset owner needed to be confident that the asset had been maintained prior to that specialist maintenance in the correct manner. So all that needed to be um, written into the agreement and, and visible and, and the operator needs to understand how they would report in order to make sure that that was clear. And then meaningful incentives and penalties. So again, um, we'll look at that in the KPI section here, but uh, KPI being key performance indicators. But again, if you understand the level of income that your railway is receiving, then, and how much it's costing the operator to, to operate the railway and to maintain the assets, then you'll understand what level of incentive to set to actually make that sufficiently of interest to be a target for the um, operator. So to address the challenge here, and here I've got this, Asset owner needed advanced visibility of specialist maintenance. Um, specialist maintenance responsibility lay with the asset owner, and they would be compensated in turn by the government, who were the ultimate asset owner, and to, to ensure that this railway was um, available um, within its urban environment. And therefore, um, we need to ensure that not only in the annual maintenance um, reports, but also maybe five yearly because some of the specialist maintenance doesn't happen that frequently. Um, there needed to be a way that the asset owner could see when that was going to be coming so that they could secure the funding necessary. It, took, it obviously takes time to secure funding and they need some time to do that. So that was very important to the um, asset owner in this situation. So financial frameworks, very important for the operations of railway. And the third one here is a whole of life approach to operations and maintenance. As I said at the beginning, some of these terms are only five years, um, maybe a little longer, seven years in some franchise scenarios in Europe. Um, and so the operator is only really responsible for those assets for that period of time. Um, so we wanted to encourage a master planning approach so that we could see that the operator was considering carefully the full life of the assets. Some assets like power assets, rolling stock, signaling, uh, you're talking about 25 to 30 years, maybe 35, some of the power assets. Obviously some of the other systems, um, some of the comm systems and down to seven years maybe. And so you've got a, a variation in the asset life, um, but you want to ensure that there's a whole of life approach to the operations and maintenance. So we need to make sure that um, the current agreement permitted the operator to report on an annual basis, their maintenance plans. We wanted something a bit more enhanced so that the asset owner would have visibility. So, um, you know, this was a challenge we helped to address. The operator should indicate life cycle maintenance within their annual plans. And also with a, what we called a, a master maintenance plan, which would, at the beginning when the assets are handed over from the uh, construction into operation, it was important to make sure that that was captured. So let's uh, move on. So the fourth one then, um, key performance indicators. So again, it was um, one of the key parts of what we did for this operations maintenance agreement was to um, 
ensure the right key performance indicators were proposed and implemented, that it was possible to actually calculate them from the data that was captured within the system. Um, and we put in place a hierarchy of KPIs to ensure senior management were engaged, um, that they were realistic and measurable. And, and obviously there's often a period of six months where you're measuring them and then resetting them to make sure they're realistic for your particular railway. Um, and that they were competent, the operator needed to be competent in evaluating the data to present the KPIs. And then we looked at an incentive and penalty framework um, that would be of interest and sufficient to in, ensure that there was a responsive performance. And, and that was one of the key elements of what we did for this particular um, asset owner. Finally, then, the interface management between operators. Again, on this railway, as with many railways, there are interchange stations. Um, it's a challenge on every railway to make sure, particularly as well, between the systems. So there's a lot of systems interface, as, as many of you railway engineers will be aware. Um, and in this particular railway, there was a shared depot scenario as well, where, where a depot was shared between two lines and, and therefore some of the assets within the depot used for maintenance were shared as well. So it had to be very clear who was maintaining them and what they were being used for and who was responsible for them. So we addressed the challenge here. Um, at interchange stations in particular as well, we had to ensure that there was a set of drawings for every station with the interfaces marked clearly on them and a description of how that was going to um, how that was going to be dealt with in every situation. So just to summarize then, um, so that we've got a bit of time for Q&A, um, the resulting benefit to the client once we address the challenges aligned with these five key components were improved visibility of outsourced maintenance during the contract period, a more responsive operator um, who was going to report KPIs on a, on a regular basis uh, so that it could be seen um, how they were performing and with incentives to ensure that those KPIs uh, were met. Evidence of maintenance approach to assets beyond the contractual earn-in period, greater accountability towards the asset maintenance and operation, um, and the ability to evidence improved performance through those KPIs. Um, and stakeholder management issues addressed and resolved swiftly. Quite often in audits, we'd find that there were issues such as noise adjacent to the line that had not that had been lingering for a while and hadn't really been dealt with. So it was possible to see how, when they were first reported, uh, the initial response and then the follow-up and the outcome in terms of closing those uh, issues down. So so all those um, pretty much resolved within our agreement to the benefit of both parties. So um, I think that's pretty much everything I've got to say on the webinar. Um, we've got a bit of time now for Q&A. Thanks. So Q&A number one. Uh, sorry, Joseph, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear you now? Okay. Yeah, sorry, apologies. Um, issues with my connection. I will start with the first question. Do you have, uh, do you plan to have agency maintenance in an asset management system with periodic inspections and preventative ma maintenance? I can answer that, Tim. Do you want me to answer yep. that? Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Um, do, do I plan, um, well, I'm a consultant, uh, but I can speak on behalf of some operators. Um, you can have agency or hire uh, contractors to do periodic maintenance for you. Um, there are, at least in Asia, uh, some operators do have that scheme um, in place. Um, and this is, although not very common, but um, there are agencies or contractors that does uh, corrective and pre preventive maintenance for the operator, but the assets are still owned by the operator. Do you want to supplement him or, or that's okay? Uh, I think, yeah, I think okay. 
Thank you. What type of data reporting is part of owner operator agreement? Uh, for example, train performance, schedule reliability, maintenance, etc. So, I'll do, shall I take this one? Yep. yep. So yeah, so it, it can it can be really tailored to um, what the asset owner or the operator wishes to report on. If the agreement has requirements in terms of the scheduling, um, then you'll want to address those within these um, KPIs um, in the agreement. But um, generally, it will cover the main systems. So you want to be able to ensure that you've got availability um, of your main systems, key systems that will affect operations. So, um, you should have a, these days, you should have some way of collecting the data um, if you're doing regular maintenance or if you've got some um, remote condition monitoring equipment on your railway system that captures data into a, a computerized maintenance management system. All that data is available, hard or soft, to calculate uh, train performance, train performance often based on mean time between failure or distance between failure um, with, with assets, power assets or um, signaling assets. Again, you're measuring the frequency of failure potentially. Um, so you can put all of those in the agreement. You also have customer related um, key performance indicators that you'll want to measure as well. So, um, and you'll be as I said in my webinar, you'll be running the railway if it's new for a period of time so that you can assess where your benchmark performance is um, because it'll be different for every railway in every environment, different environments uh, throughout the globe have different um, issues that they need to deal with. So um, you need to be realistic about setting those performance levels. So yeah, so it can be anywhere really. Thank you. Um, there is a ne next question is a question and also a comment. So it's a bit long. So please bear with me. Is there a specific re reason for only going with a five and a 10 year contract as this really doesn't allow for a value for money op option based on a comparison of uh, 20 uh, or 30 years contract with life, life cycle models, etc. A short term contract means that the O&M costs will be much higher based on being able to recap uh, such items or as uh, mobilization over a much shorter period and on short term there is a lack of being vested um, in the process. Shall I take this one? Yeah, please do. Yeah, so again, often the period of the contract is set so as to incentivize performance. So if you give too long a period of, of uh, operations and maintenance, unless of course it's a We'll look at that perhaps in one of the other questions, but if it's a design, build, finance and maintain model, then perhaps it's going to be a longer period because they've got to recoup the cost of potentially some investment in that system. But if it isn't, if it's purely that the operator is going to be handed a set of assets by the asset owner to operate and maintain over a period of time, then the five to ten year period is is has been set to basically say after five years, it's a bit like a rental agreement. I want to be able to evaluate whether or not you're performing well. And if you're not, I might want to get someone else to take over these assets from you um, who can perform better. Or I might incentivize you by saying, I'll give you a five year plus a five year contract. So if by the end of that five years, I'm happy with your performance, I'll give you another five years. And yes, it doesn't match the life cycle of the assets necessarily, but then the since the asset owner is taking responsibility for some of the longer term specialized maintenance, the uh, operations and maintenance agreement really only requires preventive and corrective maintenance during regular operations. So um, you're trying to set a period that's realistic, but a period that also incentivizes good performance. And that's why you don't give a period of 20 or 30 years. You'd have an incumbent that if they weren't performing would be difficult to, uh, to improve upon. 
Uh, yeah. Thank you. I will take the last question. How would you ensure the availability time slots allocated to track possessions for maintenance and replacement works? Again, do you want me to answer this one, Joseph? Um, I can go first, you, and yeah, then you, you can supplement yeah, me. Sure. Okay. You can't really, because um, everything is planned. Um, track possessions um, are actually uh, at, at the mercy of the operator and the maintainer. Um, a lot of capital works and non-capital works goes on a track at different periods of time. And depending on the priorities of maintenance activities, uh, non-capital works, training, um, ad hoc activities such as corrective maintenance, you have to review, review, um, track priorities, possession priorities on a regular basis. So um, it all depends on the priorities of the um, the owner of that track or that tracks uh, that section of track. Um, Tim, you want to supplement? Yeah, I would just probably say that. Yeah, I mean, as as you said, the the operator is best placed to determine um, track possessions. They usually have a, a possession planning process. In our specific case, the asset owner wanted to have specific access rights um, in order to carry out audits and to, to ensure that maintenance was being carried out as agreed. Um, so that was written into our agreement, um, but the operator has to approve it effectively um, and give uh, the asset owner must give reasonable notice. So um, you, you can ensure it in the agreement, but you can't always guarantee it at the time that the asset owner wants to access, um, unless it's for some emergency situation, in which case both the asset owner and the operator would be probably on the same page in terms of providing possession. But safety is also really important. So a lot of possession planning has to take, um, has to take a, a real process to be sure that it's uh, planned in advance the location on the track is understood, that the risk issues are understood and that the, you know, the all the uh, correct um, processes are in place to make it a safe access. Fantastic, thank you. Um, thank you for all the questions that were submitted to us. Uh, apologies, we don't have time to cover them all and the questions will be answered directly by the presenters via email. Uh, so we are at the end of the webinar session. Uh, thank you for joining the, the Snacker Dan webinars on asset management with this series. Uh, and this webinar concludes uh, this series. We hope you enjoyed it and thank you for, for attending. Um, thank you, Tim and Joseph for presenting today and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone.